Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to talk about data engineering on the Databricks Lakehouse platform today. My name is Paul Lapis. I'm a product manager at Databricks, and I'll be joined by Jason Shiverick, who's a principal data scientist at Rivian, as well as Frank Muntz, who's a senior engineer at Databricks as well, who's going to give us a, a great demo of the capabilities. So uh, before we get started, I wanted to mention everything I'm going to say today is for informational purposes only. Nothing I say should be a commitment. Lawyers made me say that. And, um, uh, but it's no surprise to people in this room that data is critical to make business decisions. Organizations are getting really good at using data to drive uh, better customer experiences, to drive revenue, to uh, get better at operations so they can reduce their bottom line and save money and build better products and services. And um, you know, data is something that most customers or that most companies are using, they want to use more of, and that trend is continuing to grow. But as the amount of data is exploding inside of these organizations, teams still struggle to use it in a way uh, where they can get value out of it. The vast majority of data still goes unused today. Uh, and there's a few reasons why. In order to actually build data pipelines to prepare them for ML and analytics, teams have to stitch together and get different systems to work together and to integrate. Oftentimes, this means that you need subject matter experts in different domains to be able to integrate these services. Uh, to build um, data pipelines, and uh, it's really hard to find people that know all those all those different domains, and they um, also have to rely on hand coding to deal with things like schema evolution and deal with structured and unstructured data. Um, and then finally, once they actually get those tools to work together and those systems to work together, they end up um, struggling with operations. You know, getting data to be delivered on time within some SLA to meet cost performance goals for organizations is really really hard. Um, you know, we. We talk to data teams who end up, in some cases, that have days of outages because they, they don't understand how data became corrupted in their tables, and they end up having to pause everything until they figure it out. Um, so those, those, um, you know, those operational benefits or are, are, you know, challenges are real. Uh, and then finally, most companies that we talk to have a need to get data more and more quickly for really good business reasons. Um, increasing the SLA and data freshness while um, maintaining good cost performance oftentimes requires them to build a whole separate system for streaming that's separate from their batch system. So that just doubles the amount of complexity that they have to deal with. So how can the Databricks Lakehouse platform help? Um, Databricks Lakehouse platform provides a unified way to handle data engineering, as well as data warehousing, data streaming, and data science and ML, and ML activities all within a single platform with um, great um, you know, um, you know, governance and unification. For data engineering, uh, we provide tools to let customers easily ingest structured and unstructured data transform that data, aggregate it to deliver it for ML, for analytics, and for AI. And then finally, to orchestrate their various workflows across the entire Lakehouse platform and do so in a way that's simple. So let's take a little bit of a closer look about um, how data engineering on the Lakehouse works. You know, most customers that we work with build ETL pipelines. After you get to a certain size, it's no, you know, no surprise that the business, to deliver business um, data to the business, it has to be clean and correct and complete, and that requires ingesting it, transforming it, testing it, and make sure that it's of high quality. So at some level, everyone's doing ETL. And what, what the Lakehouse platform provides is a unified way to do batch and streaming in the same API we also provide great frameworks and tooling to be able to test and develop your pipelines in environments that are separate from production. As your transformations are evolving to deal with new types of data, as your business requirements change, you end up needing to make changes to your data pipelines. Doing that is really hard in an isolated way so that you're not disrupting your production data sets. The third thing is orchestration. You can orchestrate um, in the, in the lake house, you can orchestrate SQL alongside your ML workflows, alongside your ingestion workflows uh, with really, really simple UIs and APIs. And then finally, all of this is secured and governed so that you can meet regulatory requirements and your security requirements as well. And so the, the, uh, the lake house platform provides all these capabilities for you. 
Let's sort of start by talking a little bit about ingestion. Um, obviously, getting data into the lake house is the first step. Uh, Databricks provides uh, facilities to ingest data continuously, it, to process it as data arrives, if that's something that you require. Uh, but you can also schedule your ingestion to be based on a time trigger or other triggers. And it does this using a capability called the autoloader. The autoloader is essentially a streaming source that will incrementally and efficiently process new data as they arrive in the cloud. And so you basically have to write code and then just use the word cloud files as a function that becomes a streaming source. You can pass into that function any path on ADLS or S3 or, or a Google Cloud Storage. And what we will do is ensure exactly once delivery of new data that arrives into that location. Or if there's data already in that location, we can also ingest that as well if you choose to. And there's a few other really, really cool things that we've built with the autoloader. Uh, to make that really, really easy. So number one is schema inference. So um, we will detect what the schema is of the data. Uh, and if you have an idea of what, uh, of what the schema is as well, you can superimpose hints and tell us what, you know, what the schema should be. We also handle evolution automatically. So as new columns arrive, we'll automatically add columns to your destination table so that you don't have to worry about handling or managing that. And then also, if you, if you do end up defining your schema and we detect data that doesn't conform to it, we'll set that aside into a rescue location, into a rescue data column, so that you can go choose it uh, to process it later if you choose to. All this is supported with JSON, CSV, and Avro data types today with um, Parquet coming very, very soon. Delta Live Tables is the first ETL framework that provides a declarative way to build streaming or batch pipelines and automatically handling operations and scaling for you. Uh, so the way that it does this is, so this is effectively you know, our solution for ETL on Databricks. The way that it does this um, is, um, or uh, the, the main benefits of Delta Live Tables are um, uh, really making it easier for you to build ETL pipelines. We provide um, SQL and Python APIs. All you have to do, if you look at the, at the, at the snippets of code on the left-hand side, that's a data pipeline. We're ingesting data into a streaming live table called raw data from a raw data bucket using cloud files, and then we're processing it into a clean data. We're defining some SQL query on top of that um, data set and then that becomes a data pipeline. You don't have to worry about you know, managing checkpoints. You don't have to worry about um, the dependencies or dependency tracking. Uh, we will run all that for you automatically and give you a nice DAG and show you how it looks uh, and give you lineage. Uh, and then number two is we provide a way to develop and test it using modern software engineering best practices. So Delta Live Tables provides a settings file that um, is um, associated with your code that, uh, that allows you to parameterize the inputs and outputs of that data pipeline so that you can have the same version of your ETL pipeline code running in different environments, but sending data to different locations. So you can use that in order to do CI, CD. You can have the same version of your code running in two different environments. Your staging environment is sending data to a staging schema so that you can evaluate um, the output of your data as you change your transformations, all sourcing from the same cloud files locations. And this all works out of the box with SQL as well. It's really hard to build this stuff if you try it. Um, and so this you know, sort of comes out of the box with DLT. But the second thing is automatically managing your infrastructure. Delta Live Tables has an enhanced version of auto scaling that's optimized for streaming workloads. It will scale up only to the amount of instances needed, and then it'll scale down as well if we detect that doing so is safe to maintain your SLAs. And so with enhanced auto scaling, you can save a lot of money on infrastructure with Delta Live Tables. Um, it also handles optimization in the physical layout of data without you having to take any additional actions. So things like vacuum, optimize, is all handled out of the box without you needing to take any other action. Data quality is something that our customers tell us is really important. Teams end up spending resources building quite coarse grained data quality frameworks where they try to detect data quality issues and stop the pipeline if there's a problem. There's a few issues with those approaches. One of the problems is it's, you know, number one, it's, it's kind of coarse grained. You don't really want to stipe the pipeline unless you really need to. 
Um, and you also want to be able to figure out the root cause of that data. You want to be able to correlate the actual bad data with what tests failed so that you can actually feed that to your upstream providers to fix the data at the source. And so um, Delta Live Tables includes a feature called expectations that allows you to write rules to test data as it arrives and policies to, of what to do if those tests fail. So for example, you can have a rule that will um, validate that this column is an email address, and if it fails, you can choose to drop the row, quarantine it, do nothing and log it. You can stop the whole pipeline if you choose to. Uh, and then we will store all this data in an event log so that you can trend, measure data quality statistics and observability statistics of your data pipeline over time. And then finally, unified batch and streaming. Delta Live Tables introduces a streaming live table object into the lake house, which is a stateful streaming object based on structured streaming, on Spark's structured streaming, that allows you to handle streaming batch workloads all within the same API. And then finally, I wanted to talk about workflows. Workflows is the way that you can orchestrate anything in the lake house. It allows data engineers and analysts to orchestrate ML, data engineering and AI workflows. You can orchestrate um, regular notebooks, jars, ingestion tasks, Delta Life tables, pipelines across any cloud. And you can do it in a way that's really intuitive and simple using a GUI or a CLI and an API. Some of the patterns that we see that our customers are taking is, for example, if you have a data pipeline and you want to you know, sync it to a Kafka topic, you'll use Delta Life tables to to you know, ingest, transform, ensure data quality of your data. You'll create delta tables on the lake house with delta live tables. And then you can orchestrate that pipeline with another notebook that will take that data and publish it to a Kafka topic. So that, that sort of orchestration is what customers can do with workflows. And if you write that code once, it can be ported to any cloud as well. So now I'd like to um, take a moment and introduce Frank who's a senior engineer at Databricks to walk us through a demo of how all this works in practice. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Frank. I'm the guy who's standing between Paul's great presentation and an amazing customer um, story that we have. Um, I understand most of you are data engineers, so you, maybe you want to become a data engineer. It's a perfect um, location here to, to gain some knowledge. Um, if you think about what is an engineer supposed to do, he's supposed to solve hard problems. Now, I imagine the following. Your boss is talking to you and says, hey, couldn't you build such a system that kind of tracks what people talk about us on, on Twitter, about our company, about our products, and then you know, apply some machine learning and classify those tweets into positive or negative, so we know if we have a you know, if the, the, the public image of our company is good or not so good. Now, this could apply to a sushi place in San Francisco where people tweet about, you know, the sashimi and nigiri, but it could also apply to Databricks. Um, and um, what I want to do in like 10 to 15 minutes together with you is build this kind of thing. So that's the target architecture. So if you're on Twitter, get out your um, Twitter clients, get out your phones. I need you to help me on this. It's basically what we need is like three big blocks. One is to tap into Twitter. I want to collect some tweets. Tweets are not big data if you think about this. It's 140, 280 characters. They're constantly produced. We expect that we process them in, not in real time, but, but in time, which is Altogether is the textbook definition of streaming data. So we have to be able to, stream, to work with them streaming data. The idea is to just stream into a data lake, which is not a bad pattern because it decouples the whole thing from what is coming next. So it's an S3 bucket, to be honest, but we can abstract it with DBFS. It's the Databricks um, file system, which kind of helps me that I don't have this key value access to S3 objects, but I can just treat it as a file system, as a folder. And then we need to talk about the delta life tables, how to ingest the data. Um, what you will see is we have this, logically, for me, it looks like a T. We go from bronze to silver when we increase the data quality. But at the same time, there is this, this T part 
I, I have an, another table that keeps track of the languages that we use in these tweets. And at the very end, we apply some machine learning. And probably if it's your boss, he will tell you, look, shouldn't be too complicated, like three to five lines of you know, hugging face and transformer model. And then you classify the tweets. Sounds like boss talk, isn't it? Um, let's see if we can get there. So first of all, we need to get into Twitter connect to Twitter and get a live stream out of Twitter. That's the challenge, and this is where I need your help. I have some code. It's um, Python code running in a Databricks notebook. And what you need to understand is I'm using Tweepy, which is a very popular Twitter library for um, Python. And what you need to understand are those two lines. It's actually a kind of search expression, what we're looking for. So I'm looking for English and German tweets. Um, and the keywords are Databricks, Data AI Summit, Lakehouse, DLT, Data Life Tables. So remember the keywords. Um, if you can open your Twitter client and tweet. Now, don't tweet yet. I, I'll tell you a little bit more. Um, that's my Twitter client. And um, remember, we want to make sure people talk in a positive way. So I say something like, DLT is amazing. And you all are a great audience. Now, we do more. We should add some emojis, because the machine learning language model will also understand the emojis. That's one thing. And the other thing is, if I put a lot of colorful emojis and I ask you to do the same, it is just much easier to spot those tweets in the whole, well, in the whole data stream. It's a bit like printf debugging, where you attach like three asterisks to the front to, um, to find it in your log files. I can do it on stage. Why not? OK, I'll do this. I tweet. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't tweet yet. I need to run this first. It is, no, it is running, actually. So it's collecting the tweets already. So these are the tweets. Now I tweet. Are you tweeting as well? Please go for it. Add as many emojis as you can. And let's see if we can, oops, that's more scrolling problem. There we go. Where's my tweet? Can we find it? Oh, it's way down. Look at this. There it is. Isn't that great? That's streaming data live. Where are you guys? Is that you? DLT is cool with the sunglasses. Whoever did that, fantastic. OK. So this is streaming into the data lake. It's not in the lake house yet. You want to go to the lake house, no? Because you want to have all those benefits from the lake house, like A, like asset transactions, to C, like C ordering. And this is what happens in the next step, in this step. So I'm doing delta life tables. And the first thing that I do here is using autoloader, like Paul explained. The super cool thing about autoloader is it infers the schema. What is coming from Twitter is really complex. It has like 40 different columns. And actually, I should map those column names to data types. And I don't want to do that. Autoloader is doing that for me. And that's fantastic. The second thing is it's only two lines. When I was demoing this to um, new hires that we had at Databricks, uh, a guy coming from AWS told me, hey, Frank, that's cool what you show us, but you don't show us the really challenging part where you probably behind the scenes have to set up an SNS you know, um, notification service that makes the whole autoloader thing efficient. And I said, well, I'm not never doing that. That's the platform doing this for me, which brings me to multi-cloud. You know, the same two lines would work on GCP and Azure as well. So I don't want to have those cloud details. I like this abstraction with autoloader. Then the next thing that you see is I create a table. It's a bronze table. It's a streaming table. Um, because it's streaming, it will work in an incremental way. So it will remember the, the, the tweets it already read, and it will just read the tweets that happened in between um, the last time I triggered the pipeline and when I triggered the pipeline again. And then what you see, this is the bronze table. I have another table. It's a silver table, and the silver table is based on the brass table. That's the classical pattern that we see. It's called CTAS, create table as select, and it's this create table silver as select. And now is the first time where I reduce the amount of data. Remember, I had 40 different columns in, in, in my tweets, and I reduce it. Basically, I want the text, but I'll keep some more columns. Um, that's one thing. Now, 
there is another thing. If you look at this tweet, you will see some tweets which are not in English. So usually I see some German ones. Um, sometimes I see some Spanish ones. And they go wrong. They go wrong because the machine learning model is pre-trained, but only for English language. So what I need to do is I need to use those expectations that Paul was talking about. It's a constraint. It's pure SQL. I say, well, if the language is, I expect the language to be English if it's not dropped a row. So now we did two things. We dropped some columns because we don't need them. And we're dropping rows because we don't need them. And this is to improve the data quality. Now the third table, it's not crazy, uh, crazy important. It's a languages table where I keep track of the languages that I see and the number um, of tweets in this language. If I run this, um, if you look at the real pipeline, it should be here. It was reading like a thousand tweets when I ran this before you all came in, and um, 898 made it from bronze to silver. Now those 103, they got dropped because it was the wrong language, which is you know improving data quality. If I run this again, what should happen is it should not read like 800 tweets, but just the amount of tweets you were doing and other people were doing while I was talking. Um, it should work in this incremental way. So the number here should be um, much smaller. So it takes a while to, to run. It's 210 that happened in between. And now it's processing. It's trying to calculate what needs to go to silver. Out of 210, 208 go to silver. Two are dropped. If you look at this, you get the data quality here. It's two are dropped, that's 1%. Well, it's not too bad. Actually, it depends on you know, how many people tweet in different languages. If we look at BROS, you will also see those, hang on, those 40 different columns that I never had to map, so I didn't really care about the schema because it was auto-detected. So that's the cool thing about um, Delta Life tables. Now, this whole demo is available on GitHub. You can just grab it on GitHub. I'll show you the link in, in a minute and then play with it and you know explore. Like I build it to explore between development and production mode, where we keep the cluster up or we shut the cluster down, um, between having um, different configurations and running pipelines triggered or in a continuous mode. Um, and it's fantastic um, because it's only three tables to explore this. A few more things I want to point out. Those tables that I create in SQL, they obviously show up here under the Data Explorer. And then I can click on them. And for example, it tells me an interesting story. If I look at this, the JSON files that I wrote to this directory, um, I was running this before you came here. It's 390 files. So the irony in big data sometimes is in big data, we have this too many small files problem. Now, I was writing 390 files. And at some point, opening all those files and reading 140 characters from a tweet, well, opening the file takes you more time than reading the real data. So having too many small files is an issue. And if I talk to my data engineering friends, they all tell me, like, we have this every single day. Now, what DLT does for you, um, is, hang on, look at this, it's showing, where has it gone to? Uh, I don't see it anymore. It might be a screen thing. Let me reload this data, browse table. Mm, that changed anyway. Usually it shows you like it's, uh, it's stored. Oh, here it comes. I don't know. This is like when you do stuff live. Um, number of files, two. So it went down from 390 to two. So you, too many small files problem is solved. Now, let's come to the result. Like, uh, let's see what is really happening if we do the machine learning. Now, the machine learning is easy. All I do is use the transformers. I pip install them. Then I read my data again. And remember, it's just a delta lake table. So I read my tweets silver, which is the processed, cleaned, um, transformed data. I read it. I put it to a pandas frame. And then basically, I send it to that pipeline. And the pipeline is a bird model. It's optimized for tweets. I told you it understands about these emojis and stuff. 
It only works for English. That's a small, it's a poor man version of the pipeline. So I can send um, data to the pipeline, like a smiley face, like not good at all, like I love the lake house. If I run this, the output is the first one is positive, 92%, then it's negative, and then it's positive again. So it really understands the context, it understands smileys. This is my test data to the real pipeline, to the sentiment pipeline. I feed the tweets as a list, and this is the output. These are the top tweets sorted by score, so the most likely positive tweets are on top. DLT rocks, you're an amazing audience, that worked pretty well. Um, remember your boss told you to um, find out about how the company is doing? That's the result that you should print out and put on the desk of your boss. So it's 100 minus 7, it's 93% are positive or neutral. That's not bad if you're this company, and this was all about data breaks, by the way. And that's the thing that you should maybe print out and stick next to the coffee machine. That's a word cloud where you see the most frequent words in the most positive tweets, which is not bad if you look at this. So data summit, data breaks, DLT. This is all stuff that you guys were tweeting. All right, and that brings me to the end. I could show you the same thing running as a workflow. You see I was struggling a bit like orchestrating between those different notebooks and uh, I can run this as a workflow. I'll start this while Jason is coming up on stage. So I can go to workflows. I have the same thing as a workflow. Um, it looks like this. And you orchestrate the ingestion, the DLT, Delta Life tables, and the hugging phase. You schedule it, you run it like, you know, every night, every morning. If you want, you schedule the ingestion in a separate workflow, keep it running whole day, and then run the machine learning just once a day, whatever. With this, I want to hand over to Jason. Thank you for your attention. Just... Okay, we give you the slides, you don't need to um, take this. Hi, uh, I work at Rivian. We make really cool electric trucks and SUVs. Um, I want one really bad. Uh, <laughs> as many people asked me for theirs yesterday. Um, the, uh, so we, one of the critical data sets that we have is uh, vehicle service data. Um, it allows us to understand what's happening in the field to the vehicles, uh, what, what, what parts are being replaced. It allows us to forecast those uh, part replacements and do prognostics modeling. Uh, so it's a very critical data set for us. And uh, this is the architecture of how we get that data from the uh, service centers. Uh, there's a, basically a client that service engineers write uh, so part replacements and, and kind of what, what they're doing in service uh, through a web portal and that gets uploaded into a DynamoDB table. And uh, we mine all of that data in a, in a warehouse in Databricks uh, for, for modeling and prognostics. Um, that data gets pumped into JSON files from DynamoDB into an S3 bucket and we uh, use Delta Live tables to kind of unpack all of those JSON files. <clears throat> uh, this is, this is a kind of a snippet from that pipeline, from that architecture. Um, we're using uh, Autoloader to kind of uh, just, just scrape through all of the, those JSON files and unpack them. And uh, the, I think the cool part about this, this like, this, this, uh, what this piece of code is uh, represents what the pipeline looked like before we started using DLT. Um, and I think what's cool about it is this, this functional kind of paradigm at the top is uh, a really nice way to write the code uh, that's completely compatible with DLT. Um, <clears throat> but, but if you wanted to like, write this pipeline in a notebook, this is kind of what it would look like. And the important part here is these pieces of code at the bottom, uh, this, this write stream to Delta uh, with checkpoint location and available now and, and like the path to write the data to 
is, is all handled by Delta Live tables, uh, as well as the create table, create database, uh, the optimize commands, and all of the vacuum. So this whole block of code at the bottom here is effectively redundant, made redundant by DLT. And that's what the, this is what the code looks like uh, using DLT. We basically, you add this decorator on top, which manages the, uh, the whole pipeline, and it allows you to remove all of those prior blocks of code. Uh, what's super important for me is that those pieces of code, the checkpoint location, uh, the, the path that you write the data to, is, is all architectural things to think about. And I don't want to have to think about that every time I write a pipeline. It's super nice to just set up a path for your ETL to land in uh, one at, at the beginning. And then, and then DLT takes care of like what folder path does each table get written to, what folder path does the checkpoint get written to. And on top of that, it's just uh, it removes the boilerplate code. Um, what, the other thing I like about this is the, the, the function here is the same. It's a, it's a nice functional pattern that I think if you're writing code like, like this uh, as a data engineer, um, <clears throat> it's a really good pattern to like pass off to people who, who are new to ETL. Um, it's just a really, it's a, it's a nice functional approach to, to the design of your pipelines. And it gives a good pattern for uh, new people coming into this uh, workflow. The uh, I think what what the f the first time I saw DLT I thought is this a GUI I don't want a GUI I want code so I didn't I didn't play with it and then they Paul convinced me to try it out and I realized that the the graphical like DAG that that's displayed is is really a uh, emergent property of the code um, and that kind of that that changed my mind uh, pretty deeply I like that it, everything is first. It allows us to use uh, our, our normal software stack. We get to use um, Terraform. We get to use CI CD. We get to use Git, um, which is all very important to me as, a, as someone who's managing the production workflow. Um, and I think what's super cool is the, the relationship between uh, components of your ETL are defined in the code by a DLT read stream, which is effectively a Spark read stream that, that wraps this like uh, all of the under under the hood stuff that would make the uh, relationships happen and kind of show you this cool code, uh, this cool graph. So, <clears throat> yeah, the, the just the emergent property of like switching your code from a normal pipeline to using uh, DLT makes it uh, super cool to to work with. Um, <clears throat> so to kind of okay, wrap up, why we really like using DLT. Uh, it reduces all of the architectural overhead um, that, that comes with building ETL by managing your paths for you, uh, managing checkpoint paths. It does all the, the creates and the optimize and vacuum and allows you to switch between continuous and triggered uh, available now, which is super nice. Um, the, the data validation uh, that Frank talked about is, is a really nice feature. Uh, one thing that we liked a lot when we were going through developing this this specific pipeline was the full refresh capability. Uh, we found that like if you have to restart your pipeline, uh, some, you have to go into S3 and like delete the tables and everything, uh, and being able to just click a button that does full refresh from the beginning of time makes it super easy to develop uh, with a button click. Um, and I'll finish up with a quote from the uh, data architect who m built most of this service data pipeline. Um, yeah, he, he, he talked about how easy it is to use for someone who's kind of coming up from an analytics and architectural background, and I've got him like totally converted from Redshift to DLT. So, thank you. <laughs> nice job. Thanks. And Frank, um, I'll just leave you with one more slide. Please check out Delta Lab Tables if you haven't in our workflow solutions at databricks.com slash product slash Delta Lab Tables. If you're interested in learning more about Delta Lab Tables, stay in this room. I think they're going to make you go out and come back in. Michael Armbrust, who's the creator of DLT and structured streaming and Delta, will be here to provide a deep dive of Delta Lab Tables. And then at 205, 
we will also be talking about orchestration and workflows and then streaming at 250. So hope to see you there and thank you for coming to the event. Thank you.